I'm the only child. Um, it's just me and my mom. We live together and we are close, we're best buds. My family and I are pretty close. Um, obviously we've had our ups and downs, you know, we go through a lot of things. Um, I think I have a really close relationship with my mother and my father. I wish we were closer to my mother stays in Limpopo, in a, uh, a rural village, and I haven't seen her in like seven months. They're the people that like get me through everything that I go through. You can't replace those people, the impact they have in your life. Guys are making me emotional here. <laughs>
Pravardi von Staden is a professor of philosophy and psychiatry and director of the Center for Ethics and Philosophy of Health Sciences at the University of Pretoria, with a clinical attachment as honorary psychiatrist at Vescovi's Psychiatric Hospital. And our final panel member is Ms. Primaroshni Gawa, the media relations manager at the University of Pretoria. A journalist by training, she was an education journalist at Business Day and an education editor at the Mail and Guardian. Before we begin with the discussion, a friendly reminder for our viewers to post your questions and remarks in the comment section, which we will address later during the session. Welcome to our panelists. Firstly, Professor Coupe, as a media expert and academic, what should the role of media in disseminating health research? No, health is obviously vital for all of us and for any society. And media is normally the only means of society-wide communications. Now, in the health area, of course, all, all of, most of the public are not experts. And there are many myths, superstitions, and misinformation that floats out there. So the role of the media fundamentally there for at least, I would say, at least three or four roles. First, to provide accurate, verified information to the public on health matters. In other words, to counter some of things that people might wrongly believe or must be spread by things like lack of knowledge, superstition, if you like, and misinformation. And that's just generally we don't know much about, uh, if you like, uh, our bodies, our health circumstances, and so on. So the informational role is very, very important, but verified, accurate information, prefer preferably information that is sourced from experts who are well-trained and in good standing mm -hmm. in their own professions. That means doctors, policy makers, health and, and, and related personnel. And then also, of course, I think that the media always plays in, in a role in providing people with platforms for debate and discussion. And also for, if you like, opinion making, but by people who have a right to make an opinion in relation to medical matters and then for debates to happen in that, that kind of space. The two roles, of course, are interrelated. A, a debate should be as, as best as possible based on accurate, verified, factual information. There shouldn't be mere opinion, because health also affects things that could be dangerous if their information is actually wrong. And influential people who are opinion makers should not get into that kind of opinion space if they don't, do not have verified facts. But debates between medical experts, doctors, and researchers is also healthy for societies. It is healthy in their domains of doing, being health researchers and also in their seminars and conferences and all of that and in teaching students. Then, of course, I think that the media has a, right, has, has a role in investigating information that is wrong, things that go wrong in a health system, and things that, in a sense, uh, you know, like recent happenings where there is corruption in the health uh, sphere, it is the right of the, the, the media to be a watchdog for society because if that is not investigated, the harm society is actually, yeah, is actually great. By the way, also over time, the entertainment role of the media is very important even in this domain because people do not only absorb information as factual, verified things using particular forms of media, including humor, cartoons, and all of that is a wonderful way of teaching people about their health and also promoting personal health care, personal hygiene, and also uh, public health more broadly. Children love animated cartoons, and there's no better way to teach them about their own health and health in general than using entertaining forms of, uh, of media. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Prof. Coupe. And as a follow-up um, to that question, and I'll also ask Prim to chip in once you have responded to the, to the question, what strategies should be put in place to improve the level of knowledge on the role of media in research amongst health researchers? So the one thing that I'm talking a lot about almost every day in these various webinars and seminars is something I call critical information literacy or critical media literacy. Because we don't have much of that in most societies and media are so powerful and sometimes the way they present things seems so real. And now, of course, enter social, the so-called social media, strange term. All media is social, all communication is social. But we know the social media is one that is based on digital platforms. That is very important, therefore, 
for or in all societies and among health researchers particularly to have critical information literacy and critical media literacy. And this has two dimensions. It's not just knowing what you know as an expert, a health researcher, a health expert, top doctor or whatever you are. It's actually knowing how people in a sense consume information and how then they use information that they consume. The one thing that is pretty um, important is that people often go to media sometimes to reinforce what they believe some of which might be wrong. And so in packaging information, especially for the purposes of public consumption in public media, it's important for health researchers to understand that where audiences are coming from and what influences uh, uh, bear upon them when they, they, when they, in a sense, encounter different sources of information. And with social media, to you know that there's an avalanche of misinformation, disinformation, including your know, vaccine, hesitation, conspiracies, Absolutely. conspiracies about the, the, the origins of COVID or any other disease for that matter. And the general lack of knowledge that the public has uh, about, about, about health and health-related health matters. So, so let me put it this way. It would be useful for health researchers to get a structured course in public health communication and, and engaging different sorts of audiences among. Because these differ from age to age. You know, the older, the less educated might be, you know, quote unquote, victims of superstition or lack of knowledge. The younger is my peer influence and being on the social media all of the time, more prone to believing that what is on the social media is what is actually accurate. So critical information and critical media literacy to me is now a must for almost any professional, not just health professionals. Thank you so much, Prof. Coupe. And now I'd also ask Prim, just please, um, may you also chip in on some of the key things that our Prof has just shared with us at this moment. Okay, I think that uh, all researchers who are appointed at UP should be given media training and the Department of Institutional Advancement does that. We do social media training, we do a workshop on what does news, what makes news, and we train uh, scientists on how to interact with the media and how to write media releases. I think that's very important because we wouldn't go, want them to go out in the cold. And I know the university will be offering a science communications course. So they need exposure at the outset, maybe when they get employed and there's uh, job orientation. Uh, because I think it's a responsibility to, compute, to communicate their research findings to the public. Thank you so much, Prim. Now, um, in addition to that, Prim, from your perspective, why is it important for health researchers to disseminate their research findings through media and social media? Okay, as Professor Cooper said, the media is very powerful. TV and radio have huge audiences and also community media. They reach people uh, that aren't reached by print media. And social media is very powerful. Um, incredibly powerful, actually. So uh, it's important to disseminate the, the research findings through the media because what other avenues do they have? When researchers publish their findings, uh, they do so in a peer-reviewed journal. And what happens to that information if they don't share it with the public? It gets buried until someone else builds on their research and announces a major breakthrough. So it's important to share the research findings with the public as a means of educating them and enlightening them. And in, uh, in terms of accountability, researchers are funded by taxpayers, uh, government funding, the National Research Foundation, donors, overseas universities. So they need to see what the return on, on investment is. And we need to debunk the myth that universities are in ivory tower. In fact, UP is a hotbed of research activity. It's a repository of research activity and our scientists provide a world of answers and they produce a research that matters. So the media is powerful in that way. And when you publish in journals, you hope that other scientists will cite you and you improve your age index. But people, uh, the public can't go to a local supermarket or hypermarket or bookstore to actually buy a journal. Journals are very uh, expensive to purchase. And even it's difficult to subscribe to the web of science and to Scopus. So it's easy to get the findings out through the media and uh, because the media is powerful and they look for what's newsworthy. So your research findings has to be newsworthy. It shouldn't be blue sky research. And um, it's also important to get the research out because 
You want to educate the public and you could inspire the new generation of scientists. If someone hears what you have to say about COVID or a vaccine, you could inspire a young child to become a scientist and we have a shortage of scientists in this country. So in that way, it's um, very important to share your research, your research. And being in the media, when you, when you talk about your research, it helps you build your brand, your personal brand. It helps you build the university's brand. Um, one of the university's strategic imperatives is internationalization. So we try to get international exposure in terms of research for the university. And when you speak about your research in the media, you can, it can be a link, the media can be a link between industry, policy makers. You could have a venture capitalist who could join with you and you know, partner with you. You could attract overseas scientists, the top scientists overseas, and uh, you know, attract the cream of the crop of postgraduate students. So the benefits are multifold, but it's, it's important to talk to about your research because you help to make it accessible to the public and you democratize science. And if people know what your research is about, so if you're talking about the discovery in TV, it'll change lives and they need to know. Or if you're talking about research on herbal products that help uh, with arthritis pain. Now, is there, scientific, is there scientific evidence that if you take um, uh, ginger, for example, ginger, is that going to help you with your pain or garlic? So people need to make informed decisions based on science. And if you educate the public, then they can take decisions about, for example, hand sanitizers. They were fake ones that were being sold. So educate the public, build your brand. And if you go do it through the media, it's credible. You have credibility. So you're powerful as a scientist. Thank you so much, Prim. And I then, Marty, I, I yeah. just, um, I, we just have, uh, I've got examples of what makes news. And one is a TV interview with the late Professor Anton Stoltz, who uh, with the University of Leicester invented a TV mask with a 3D insert that detects whether a person has TV in 30 seconds. And that has huge, implication, huge implications for health economics. So we will play that now. In the beginning, we used uh, gelatine discs that we just put into a mask. Now, usually what people do is with the coughing, they get the sputum from the lungs. What we're doing is that we're catching it into a mask. And in this mask, you either have the disc that was gelatine, then what happened is it changed to something else. This something else was a polyvinyl alcohol. And it is, looks like a plastic. Um, if you think about it, wood glue is basically also, it's made of uh, PVA. What happens is, is when you breathe out, these small particles comes out of your lungs and what happens is they adhere onto this piece of plastic, which is water soluble. Now what we then do is we take this, this particles uh, on the surface of that uh, piece of PVA, we put it right into the machine uh, without de uh, decontamination or anything like that. And what we then have is immediately we have an answer within about an hour. Patients wear this for basically half an hour. We have tested it for well, one hour, half an hour, two hours. And then we saw that half an hour uh, was enough to saturate actually the pieces of this PVA inside the mask. Okay, and then we are going to look at, there's a podcast with an interview with Professor Lynn Marie Burkholz. She made, she and her team made a major malaria breakthrough in January, and we got international media exposure from her breakthrough. Health Matters now moving away from COVID-19 and focusing on something else that has certainly been a significant problem in South Africa, but a, a much larger problem on other parts of the African continent and indeed in parts of South America, uh, the Far East and so on. That's the problem of malaria. The researchers at the University of Pretoria, they're part of an international team, have discovered new chemical compounds that could be an, provide an answer in treating and pushing towards the elimination of malaria. Their findings were published in the magazine Nature Communications on Monday, and we're joined now by one of the South African participants in that. Professor Lynn-Marie Burkholz is oh. at the University of Pretoria's Institute for Sustainable Malaria Control Research. Uh, Professor, welcome and thanks very much for giving us your time. Good afternoon, John. Thank you for the interview. So the compounds that you are, that you are working with, is this as a prophylactic or is it treatment for people already infected? 
Yeah, well, actually, John, it's, it's actually neither of the two uh-huh, okay. are completely new. Yeah. Right. So, so that's what we quite excited about at the University of Pretoria. So, so we were able to identify compounds that can be used prophylactically as well as for treatment. But what's new is really that we now have compounds in hand that are able to block the transmission of the parasite between humans and mosquitoes. So this is a, a new set of compounds that we now um, can use for malaria elimination strategies. So now we're talking about stopping the spread of disease. Thank you so much, Prim, um, for sharing examples that are close to home from our very own professors at the University of Pretoria. Now, next um, for Prof. Van Staden. According to you, is media currently perceived as one of the key stakeholders by health researchers, particularly during the dissemination of research findings? This is an interesting question because it is a research question in itself and can very sensibly be research. And I think that may be something someone wants to take up uh, and, and, and research. So uh, at best, I may speculate about it, how it appears to me. And it appears to me that currently this is underutilized, um, particularly for the dissemination of research findings. And I think much more can be done to, to um, enable this, to make this happen. Some journals already have uh, various processes in place whereby their readers are prompted through, through social media um, uh, to, you know, to, to be made aware of newly published papers. So to some extent, this is already happening uh, and uh, an initiative taken up by various publishing houses. And I think that's supported, uh, that should be supported. At the Research Ethics Committee of Faculty of, Faculty of Health Sciences, we consider the dissemination of research findings really crucial. Um, and we always ask for any study, how will you tell the public about this? How would you make sure that this is uh, put in, uh, in a public space um, also for other scientists? And there are various reasons why we insist on research findings being disseminated. Um, and I can just mention a few. Of course, various resources have been spent on any research project and, uh, and those resources must be accounted for. They must be, opt- it must be optim- optimally utilized. We don't want wastage. Uh, of, of the resources of researchers, but also of research participants who quite often have, uh, you know, uh, given their time for the, for the research projects. And of course, there's also an interest in the flourishing of knowledge and that new evidence would replace um, that those outdated uh, pieces of knowledge. So various reasons that we, uh, that it's, that, various reasons why it is important that research findings be properly disseminated and optimally disseminated and with new times come new ways of doing that and social media being progressively more and more popular we should utilize that as to make sure that uh, um, that uh, investment that researchers are making into research so that investment uh, is uh, you know having optimum dividends so to speak Thank you so much, Prof. Van Staden. I will now move over to Prim. Um, so Prim, from your end, scientists are normally considered introverts and are sometimes nervous of the media. What can be done for researchers to overcome this? Okay, research among children indicates that when you talk about a scientist, they have an image of a man in a white lab coat with glasses and crazy hair and he's grumpy and he just wants to be left to his own devices to his research. And I think scientists, are, uh, they tend to be scared uh, of me in being interviewed by the media if they haven't done so before, or their colleagues sometimes tell them, oh, I was interviewed by this publication and they misquoted me and it was very traumatic. So they get put off. But uh, what we do is uh, we, you know, it takes years to become a scientist. It takes years to earn your PhD, to earn the title doctor next to your name or the word professor. And as scientists, they are knowledge producers or co-creators of knowledge. And uh, they need to understand that they are experts and they've got credibility. So they know more than than the media. And uh, they provide meaning to things like, why is the sky blue? Why Why do birds hop sometimes and walk sometimes? And in December, 
we had a case where people in Johannesburg and Pretoria were complaining about the influx of house flies. Now, we were, people wanted to know why are they flies? And Professor Chris Walden from the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences answered the question. So scientists provide meaning to life and when they speak, they speak with credibility. Uh, they, they provide a world of answers and uh, they shouldn't be scared to go to the media. We train them and uh, we hold their hands. And, and you know, uh, science is fun <laughs> and we want the scientists to be visible in the media and inspire the next generation of scientists. We need more voices in science, it's good for democracy. We need a, a diversity of scientists to be visible in the media. Any and for example, from, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead, Prim. Professor Tawana Cooper is a visible social scientist. You, you, the, the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, Professor Tian Diyaka is passionate about malaria research. He's visible and he's accessible. And it takes time. And you could start first by writing an opinion piece on something topical in the media that's you know part of your interest. And then uh, you could start with print and then write for the conversation and then approach the media office, the Department of Institutional Advancement, and we can get you into radio and TV as an expert. So when the media comes to us for comment on COVID, for example, we have a list of people that they can go to and then we can package media releases. So baby steps, but the media, unless you're terribly corrupt, you've stolen billions, You've done very unethical, something very unethical in your research. There's no need to be afraid of the media. Thank you so much, Prem. Uh, Prof. Kupi would also like to add to that. Yeah, I agree with the, everything that Prem said, but there's one other thing that we need to say also. Some media also do not put in front of scientists people who have done some basic background. And so that would make any scientist nervous. So I think yes. we need to balance the equation as well. Whoever wants to in interview a scientist better know something about what this person has is, is, is done, does, and the topic, some basic research. So they ask pertinent, relevant questions. Nothing is so annoying to a person who knows something to be asked <laughs> questions where they say, that is not right, that is not right, that is wrong, actually. <laughs> so it does uh, put off a lot of scientists who are putting lots of years <laughs> into something. So. The media also needs to invest in knowledgeable, trained journalists who understand something about health. And that is, is a weakness. We don't actually have sufficient coverage of health research and health matters in general. We don't have a sufficient number of journalists who also cover what we call the health beat, which will include research, you know, public health issues, issues to do with how the health system works, how it is funded. So it's important, I think, if the public is to get anything for that, for, for, for scientists to avail themselves for this training, but also to be treated with respect by being asked about someone who knows something. Absolutely, Prof, absolutely. Um, now, I'll actually now go back to Prem on her end. Prem, so from your expertise, how can one ensure that the expectation of privacy from users of social med media is not breached, especially in light of the Poppy Act? Okay, so um, with social media, there's no privacy. And we have an experts directory where we've got the names of scientists uh, from the various um, faculties. And we've got the exp expertise listed, but we have permission from them to give their names to the media. Some appear when, will appear on TV and radio, and some want us to publish their cell phone numbers, but we get permission from them. We won't give uh, a number of a telephone number of a scientist out without his knowledge. We we'll, we'll WhatsApp him or we we'll phone him to say, uh, "This ENCA wants to interview you on COVID. Are you available?" And these are the questions. Sometimes we get the questions, but we wouldn't just give the number to the to the journalist without informing the scientist. We wouldn't catch them off guard, and we respect Poppy. Thank you, Prem. And now we're going to invite Prof. Starden back into the conversation. Prof. Starden, Van Starden, um, can one be confident that individuals understand the privacy, privacy settings of the media platforms if this is taken as implied consent to share information? I think he's still muted, uh, Prof. Van Starden. Sorry. The sense of technology. Uh, Yes, sorry. <laughs> um, I think we need to approach that question and appreciate that some data are in public domain and some not. 
um, also when using specific media spaces or media platforms. So when data are in and are in public uh, domain, usually there's not a requirement for individual informed consent. But if, it's an, if the data are in closed media spaces, then um, we need informed consent for using that data in research, and it's usually specific to a study. So it's, I consent that my data may be used in this and this specific study. So that's the usual case. Sometimes there are exceptions. Um, and if a researcher uh, wants to do, the, you know, require an exception to be made, then that, uh, the researcher need to present the merits for, for uh, waiving the need for a specific informed consent to the ethics committee. And that is then considered on an ad hoc basis. So it's not a, um, necessarily so that for public, doc, uh, public data, data in the public domain, that informed consent is required. And if it's closed, then it needs to be specific. And there may be some instances where that can be waived. Um, and I can say that we quite often use in the Faculty of Health Sciences, we've proved various studies that uh, use um, uh, public media for the recruitment, but also as a platform by which data um, are gathered. So uh, this, is, this is not entirely new. It is, of course, developing and it is growing for people to, for researchers to use this. Um, and uh, then one needs to consider the specific requirements of that study, what's the nature of the data and whether indeed in a public domain and, um, and, and, and or not. And if it's not in the public domain, then one has to look at the, uh, one, what consent can be reasonably obtained. Um, and at times there may be a good reason to waive that, that need. But that's done in collaboration, you know, in consideration at an ethics committee. That's why researchers also need an ethics committee to put heads together, so to speak, as to do things uh, in an ethical way. Touching on the issue of ethics and consent, Prof. Van Staden, um, from your perspective, what kind of format of informed consent will be the most appropriate for the use of data from media platforms? Because that presents different challenges. Yeah. So I think the crucial thing here to appreciate is that it's not the medium. It's that's that you know that matters most. It's the what information is is uh, contained in whatever medium. So that the information should be effectively communicated uh, in, in, in obtaining informed consent in in adequate and should be adequate, of course, in 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 depth and in scope. So that sufficient information is provided for someone to make an informed decision. So what has been traditionally done on paper can be done electronically. And, and many of these studies use then an electronic medium to convey that information and also to obtain a signature or, or a, a proxy signature by clicking on a, you know, on a button uh, with a proper explanation. If you click on this button, it means this and this and this. So, it's not uh, the medium that is really the, the, the at issue here. It is, it is what is conveyed through the medium and that there's proper process and opportunity for the assimilation of that information um, in deciding on whether someone would be, but will, would be willing to participate in research. Thank you so much, Prof. Van Staden. Now I'm going to bring back our Vice Chancellor, Professor Coupe. So, Professor Coupe, how can one be sure of the authenticity of participants' identity, given the problems of fake identities, automated bots, and astroturfing, where obviously individuals are employed to adopt false identities? Well, actually, you can never be sure Fair enough. <laughs> for the reasons uh, for what you said at the end. So, but that is why I emphasize what I did at the beginning about information and critical media literacy. The only way we can do is to, to, is to teach people how to identify that something doesn't appear to be right and for them to be able to if, if seek verification elsewhere. But many of these things are done so professionally or professional looking and sound so true mm. that it is difficult for people actually to believe that it is wrong. Therefore, the, I think the, 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 the responsibility lies on the sides of the social media networks to ensure that anything that goes onto their platforms is you not know, something that will mislead the public. So far, they had a very nice affair attitude to it. Mm -hmm. That, you know, it's a platform, anything goes, it's up to the individual. 
we know that, that if you are a community, you are providing a means for a communication. You have a degree of responsibility and an ethical responsibility to make sure that what is on your platform is what is not harmful to the, to the public as well. Because you expect everybody to be able to see that this is not correct and to be sure that is, is, is too much to expect, given the social media also operate on speed and, and just created in people, you know, the, the famous form of fear of, of missing out. So, and people then push it out and, and, and share it and so on. So social media platforms have a responsibility to also take down stuff that is obviously dubious and also monitor stuff and also even to label things that this is probably not true and, and therefore prompting people to seek verification. But just do no harm is an ethical principle of communication. You provide the platform, you have a responsibility. Do no harm. Um, Prof, you touched a lot about critical um, uh, literacy and media literacy. Now, obviously now you have, um, we, the question that we have now is that how does this uh, fake identity situation affect the credibility of health research? Well, obviously, so, so very harmful. Because you know that, in the, as, as I said at the beginning, it, when it comes to health matters, to science about health and all of that, most of us don't know much, even the most educated professor in a different field. Right. So people are much more vulnerable in that regard. And that is why combating fake information and disinformation in that is so very much important. Because what people have done with harmful information about health is damage their health in so many multiple ways. And so it's, for me, it's a very, very sensitive, a very, very sensitive area. Combating misinformation in that domain is, 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 is of, of huge critical importance going forward. And that is why I say that anybody who provides a platform, whether it's a newspaper, a magazine, television station, has to assure themselves that the information is verifiable, is factual, and will do no harm. Where it is controversial, they need to present it as controversial. Where there are disputes among the medical experts, research experts, researchers and others, they have a responsibility to highlight that it is controversial. So people, in a sense, are forewarned. Thank you so much, Prof. Coupe. Um, Prof. Van Staden, we'd like to bring you in here. Given, the, um, given that anonymity is an ethical imperative, is it possible to adequately de-identify individuals in the dataverse that is increasingly networked, networked um, and searchable? Um, I first have to say that anonymity is not always an imperative. In some instances, the identity of participants must be protected, and usually we do aim generally that participants' data would be used in a de-identified way, but in some studies that may not be possible. to that data and could that access could that access be limited um, in, in various ways and we also consider the risk of a participant of participant in research being identified rather than whether it's possible to identify uh, someone so we assess that risk. sometimes it, there's a possibility but the risk is very low or the terms are such that it would be a, a fraudulent or a a criminal activity to um, actually um, access that data in that way. And of course, um, you know, there the, the are limitations into what one could protect, but so it's what could be reasonably protected in, in that instance. Um, we also look at, uh, together with that risk of consider which harm may reasonably foreseen should someone's identity be. Uh, some, someone's identity become known because there's not always or not necessarily a harm. Sometimes it is, uh, it is, uh, you know, it, it, it would not matter that much uh, or, or would matter only very little. So it's also about what in that specific instance, in that specific studies case, what would, uh, what's the potential harm that can be reasonably foreseen uh, through de-identified data. Um, but we should also appreciate that sometimes access to such data would be a criminal offence. Um, and it is not just because it can be done that it would, when it's done, then it would be okay. If it's done um, without, um, you know, without sanction, without uh, legitimate access, then that it can be a fraudulent activity to, or, or criminal activity to, to, to get access to data to which you don't have uh, um, a license to get access. 
Thank you so much, Prof. Van Staden. And uh, Prim, we would like to bring you in. From your perspective, if scientists have exciting research, what should they do? Okay, but firstly, they should not keep quiet about it. They shouldn't leave it in just to, uh, <laughs> they shouldn't leave it in academic journals. And the minute they know that they are going to be published in the Lancet or the New England Journal of Medicine, and they know the date, they should come to the Department of Institutional Advancement. Uh, we have former journalists and media relations experts there. We'll help them package the media release. Well, firstly, we'll tell them if we think it's newsworthy. So if I get an, oh my goodness, feeling like, wow, this is a breakthrough. This is amazing. Like what I felt with the 3D TV mask. We know if it's going to be newsworthy. And we decide on that using universal news values. So we will package it, we will write it, and we will organize photographs, professional photographs. We can organize videos, and there's different platforms to showcase the research on these research matters, which Professor Kupe wants to be the, science, the hub of science communications in the country. So we've got that platform, and we've got a science magazine that's coming out soon. So there's various ways to publicize uh, their research. We also like holding media briefings, like we had the first image of a black hole and it was embargoed. So we invited the media, gave them a tour. Uh, we had them experience a black hole in the, in the Kumba Virtual Reality Center. And then there was an announcement live stream from Belgium and the Uni University of Pretoria scientist was next door and he addressed the media. So we like bringing the media onto campus and uh, getting to meet the scientists and to ask questions. We can also organize online media briefings. But we, it's very important that we have uh, high resolution pictures and multimedia. Videos bring a lot of engagement and social media and infographics. So multimedia is a way to go and they can come to us in advance uh, so that we have time to help them. And we respect embargoes. We, we never break embargoes. So they're very welcome to contact us and even for media training, how to handle interviews, how to get their um, messaging across. And there's a journal article uh, titled Visible Scientist by Dr. Ray Goodall. It was written in the 1970s and she speaks about what makes for good visible scientists. Um, they are humble when they're interacting with the media. They are patient when the media mistake, makes mistakes and they forgive the journalist and they're accessible. Sometimes the media comes to you on a Sunday for comment or in the evening and it's not their fault because when news breaks, it breaks. So they, didn't, they don't get up in the morning and decide, okay, I'm going to call Professor Cooper at nine o'clock in the night for comment on violation of uh, uh, journalistic ethics in a certain country. News breaks all the time. So as I'm speaking to you now, news is happening and by the weekend it's old news. So if you want to play the media game, you need to be accessible, humble, patient. And Dr. Ray Goodall in her journal articles gives advice. But we are very happy to do media training, social media training, train people how to write um, media releases. And we are going to have a formal science communications course in the works. Uh, thank you so much, Prim. We are now going to move on to your online questions. And I'd like to obviously start off with Prof. Coupe. Prof. Coupe, from your perspective, how has the health system been affected since the presence of social media, especially the fact that you touched on factual, credible information? I think the obvious one is an overload, in my view, of false information and, and fake information on, as I said, a very sensitive matter. So vaccine, uh, vaccine hesitation or people being opposed to vaccine one of the factors you can directly lay it on the social media because people spread, I don't know how many WhatsApp videos have you seen and also claims that, you know, vaccines are going to alter your DNA, your genes, and that they are conspiracy by someone to wipe out a certain group of people, black if it is free of vaccines coming from America and so on. But again, I, as I said, the platforms make it easy to disseminate information, which is good, by the way, because if it's good information, faster is disseminated, the more positive impact, right? But if it's bad information, the faster is disseminated, also the more harm is done at greater scale than before. It's not only social media that have done that, but they have reinforced in a big way things that people often have hesitation about. Because, you know, you know, good health also is about how a person behaves. 
eating well, exercising, you know, doing Absolutely. things that do not abuse your body. And those are things that people don't like to do that much, eating your vegetables, having your spinach. And, and it's not something that people will voluntarily do, but eating junk food is what people would do. And I imagine the social media often amplifies the wrong kinds of things, if you like, reinforcing your propensity to eat more chips than you eat your more, more of your spinach. And, and, so, and so really, we're at a crisis point in this regard around, you know, fast-paced media easily available on the hand in gadgets that way, whereas traditionally media were not easily in your hands. They were at a distance, they were controlled by professionals, and they came at regular intervals, but not as an avalanche, and not as a deluge. So we have a particular problem there. However, this is not to discount the fact that some health researchers and communities of health researchers and people interested in, in this. So, for example, the Mailing Garden had a section called Peggy Sisa, which is about health information. Yes. That they are also trying to, if you like, produce and disseminate, uh, disseminate verified factual information. It takes a little more time, by the way, to produce factual verified information than it does to, to spread something that is false. Absolutely, Prof. I'd like to bring Prim back in. Um, one of the questions is, what role does the Poppy Act play in gathering data from social media? And I think Prof Van Staden can also add um, on to this response. I think Prof Staden could answer the question. I hope you're not muted, Prof. <laughs> and you're still muted, Prof. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, yes, the Poppy Act comes, with, of course, with a lot of uh, legal interpretation, and I'm, um, I'm, of course, rather hesitant to make any legal judgment about what would be um, what would be within the, the scope of the Poppy Act or not. And I, I know there are a number of uh, discussions still going on the extent to which health research would be covered or should be covered by that and whether it should be an exception made to that. Um, sorry, I know a train is going past and it must make a lot of noise there. Sorry about that. Um, uh, so the, 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 the question is um, what consent people have given and who is giving that consent to whom. So uh, with the Poppy Act, it's important that the, the person who is the custodian of the data, that that person obtains the, the, the consent for the data to be used in research. So the researcher cannot get a list from some from a custodian of data and then contact that person, those, 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 you know, that, that, those people directly for research. Um, there needs to be uh, first consent, specific consent um, by that custodian of data such that uh, someone can contact those people for, for their potential participation in research. Um, that is for data that is not in public domain. But as soon as the data um, are in public domain, the situation is uh, not, should not be problematic in terms of the, the, the Poppy Act. Thank you so much, uh, Prof Van Staden. I am going to direct the next question um, to Professor Coupe. Now, Prof Coupe, what are your thoughts on the censorship of medical and scientific discussions from world-renowned doctors, such as Dr. Tess Lowry from the Evidence-Based Medicine Consultancy and um, colleagues like Dr. Paul Marik and Dr. Pierre Corey of the Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance, who have been calling for the rollout of Ivermectin and other early treatment medicines to treat COVID-19 since 2020 already. The doctors working on the front line seems to, seem to be seeing incredible results, yet these early treatments seem to be greatly suppressed, um, seem like taboo or talk about it on social media. This is from one of our online participants. Yes, I think that the online participants should be aware that it's a hugely controversial area. And <laughs> also that the views of these doctors are hugely controversial. I mean, to be just upfront and, and to disclose, our own uh, uh -huh. Professor Vini Naido, Dean of our Faculty of Veterinary Sciences, did extensive media interviews and opinion pieces saying why meeting should not be used. That would be in direct contradiction to these doctors that are cited in that. If you ask me, it's not simply because we um, employ Professor Vinny Naido. I am with him on that score. So, so, but what would be wrong is censorship, that these doctors are being censored. I don't know that that is true. 
as, as, as the participant is questioning is, they should be allowed to, de to, 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 to propagate their views, but debated by those with an opposite view. Because that yes. is how you get to the truth. But what shouldn't be allowed is uh, their, their, one, their, own, their view being propagated. And those that also uh, 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 say evictment should not be used, should not be doing so, should not be used, should not be doing so at the expense of the other side not being heard. Then also there's a, a second thing that's very, very important. The doctors advocating this, like the ones you caught over there, should actually prove that through scientific processes, with the rigor that is necessary, with the peer review that is necessary, that they've taken into account what they, pre what they say should actually be disseminated. Because otherwise, you know, you are, you, we can't have a free for all. Simply say, have your side too, but you haven't done the rigor of peer review, ex, uh, you know, jumping through the hoops of the ethics and all of that, and the other people have. Because this is not, you cannot equalize things in that particular kind of fashion. But downright censorship is not the way to do it because it will simply go underground and appear in social media, and some people might take it as credible. They must be confronted by those who have done peer review, rigorous science, and, uh, and take an ethical approach. Thank you so much, Prof. Coupe. Um, I will direct the next question to Professor Van uh, Staden. How can we use big data to analyze the data received from social media to incorporate into social media research to especially utilize public health trends? Um, that's a big question. Um, uh, of course, we uh, you need a proper study design, proper research questions uh, that that would address your the, you know, the question specifically. That what would you want to try to track um, through social media, and then you would also need to consider how representative that would be, whether your population would be representatively accessed, and that, that may be the case, but it may also bring some kind of uh, uh, a skewness to your to your data in, in not being uh, entirely representative, um, but the 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 trends and the perceptions may be very well traced um, in this way. Um, you know, even if representative only of that population of people who are participating in social media or, 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 or active on social media, um, to 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 give us an indication where uh, proper information, proper scientifically valid information. Um, is needed and where we should uh, tell people and, and make known what the actual scientific situation is rather than mere um, claim that people are not merely making a claim for this being effective for that um, but that there's scientific rigor required before you can say something is uh, working well for example for, for, for COVID-19. Um, as uh, uh, Bruce Kupka has uh, very nicely uh, highlighted uh, just now. Thank you so much, Prof. Van Staden. Um, now, Prim, I'd like to bring you in, and hopefully Prof. Kupe can also add to this response. Do you have examples of what is considered as public domain and what is considered closed media domains? Public domain would be in the public interest. Um, so I would say, look, we've got a vaccination campaign on campus now. And that would be something in the public domain because there are lots of anti-vaxxers. I get friends asking me, would I get vaccinated? And in the closed domain, that would be something private. But I think Prof. Kupe should come in and help me here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so as I understand the question, the public domain is, you know, if like, you know, the public channels that you receive on radio, on television, newspapers, that's sold publicly, right? Anyone can buy, anyone can read, and so on. I think closed media domains, often people will create, let me give you a, a simple example. A WhatsApp group is a, a communications between people who are in the WhatsApp group. Yes. If you are not in the WhatsApp group, you are not, <laughs> you are not part of what is being discussed there, right? So it's a closed uh, media domain. And that can be done, and people have even have, have, had you know, media channels that are broadcast specifically to a certain group of people by particular kinds of technologies. Uh, and, and so the, the thing here is what is important is what Prem actually said, that the, the public domain media are in the public interest. They yes. want to have this information or whatever is on it publicly available to anybody who can because they believe that it's in the public interest. So for example, it's in the public interest to campaign about vaccines and people getting vaccinated. 
but in doing so, also speaking about what could be harmful side effects and to what extent those side effects should prevent a person taking so, or under what circumstances a person should avoid a vaccine, for example. That I think is, 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 is communicating in the public interest. But in closed media domains, people are doing their own gossip or whatever, <laughs> which is their business and, and it shouldn't be. And what shouldn't happen there is people breaching their privacy and putting it in the public domain, which is what tabloid media often do. Hacking your phone and then taking what is in your phone and your messages and putting it in the public domain. That's unethical and unnecessary. I mean, now, this is not to say that closed media domains do not have, you know, Information that is good for that group of people. One of family members with the WhatsApp group can console themselves over a death, rejoice over a birth, invite each other to weddings and Christmas parties. That's all good. It's nothing to do with the rest of us. Sometimes they can even create stock files. <laughs> yeah. um, Prem, I'd like to bring you into this question. Thanks so much, Prof. Kupe. Can the university offer support for graphical abstracts? You mean like infographics and video? Yes, I, video, yeah. video. Yes. Okay, we've got uh, we've got an external supplier who does videos, videos, and we work with the marketers if they've got a budget. We do have two graphic designers who can help, um, but I think they need to be approached early. Well, just let me add that you know anything that will better communicate to people. And use of graphics, and when they say graphical abstract, I was a little lost. <laughs> if it's the use of graphics, absolutely we encourage that because the world has become much more visual. And that is why, you know, social media networks use those emojis and, and all of that. Because some, a visual presentation of information sometimes is much more effective than using text or simply sound and word. Yeah. Absolutely, and much more engaging. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Now, we should um, show, Honey, we should show people not just tell them yeah. visuals show and they are emotive they study emotions as opposed to telling so when we had um we had a major breakthrough last week professor venan stain from the faculty of engineering built environment and information technology and his phd student uh, produced artificial avocados uh, 3d printed avocados with sensors and he tracked their transportation and a cargo ship, um, I think to the Netherlands. And um, we sent several pictures of the avocados, what they look like, a rendering of the images uh, being packaged and on the ship. And ENCA loved it. They used about 10 images. So you could actually see the avocados mixed with the real avocados and video takes you places. It creates excitement, like mosquitoes, um, you know, malaria. We showed you, we had pictures of the lab and, you know, blood samples. So it's very important that we have infographics because they're easy to read and lots of pictures and videos are also good. Sometimes the media can't come to our campus. So when they want to interview a professor, a scientist, they, for the background, they like showing images of the university. Sometimes they show images of other universities because they don't have visuals for us. So... We encourage scientists that when they do their research, take lots of pictures, send us information for infographics, and we look into making videos. Multimedia is the way to go. It's very important. Thank you so much, uh, Prim. I wonder if the avocados actually signed a consent um, to be followed <laughs> and videoed the whole time. But nonetheless, uh, very briefly from our three panels, um, if you can just address this question for our participant. Scientific news often have to be translated into layman's language. And not every scientist has these particular skills. And often at times they see this as a stumbling block in approaching the media. How can we address that as researchers. Yeah, I like the way translated into layman's language. That exactly is the challenge. So for starters, and this is what Prem was saying earlier on, for starters, scientific knowledge must be produced in scientific language. It cannot be produced in, 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 in layman's language. The translation, yes, is the second bit. So the Department of Institutional Advancement, that is Prem and her colleagues' primary role, to be that bridge between the scientific language and the language of the layman. So we also have a partner called the Conversation Africa. They specialize in doing that, in a sense, working with the artists and, and Prem and their colleagues to translate that. Translation means taking from the jargon that will only be understood by fellow scientists 
into, yeah. into simple language. We at UP want to go very big on that. So we're going to start a program in research communication. Some people call it science communication. But the jargon is not always from the scientists. People in the humanities these days and social sciences speak huge jargon as yes, well. Yes, they do. <laughs> that is only understood by themselves, among themselves. And, and public communication is not internal discussions. Group communication is actually external communications. So, 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 so we can say to the colleague, especially if they are one of us, that help is coming your way, or rather support is coming your way. And that to have impact in society, we need to master translation because then the generality of the public can understand this. Because there are fakers or the misinformation, disinformation people, they are good at translation, but actually in their translation, they distort and, and they tell lies. And so we need to be in that race competing with them and beating, him, beating them to the game. Certainly. Um, over to you, Prof. Van Staden, would you like to add to that? Yes, I think it's also important that researchers appreciate how important this communication is, this translation of their results um, is to, to, you know, to do. Um, in the same way that it is important to get a statistician involved to support you as a researcher in some of your analyses in, 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 in certain kinds of research. So it is also important to get the necessary help and support. Prof. Van Staden, it seems like we have lost you there. I think in the meantime, we'd just probably ask Prem to just chip in before we near closing of the live stream. Okay, when scientists publish in journals, they write for scientists. Now, when you write for the media, you're writing for the lay person. And I always say, if I don't understand what the scientists are saying, the media won't understand it and the public won't understand it. So I ask the, the scientist to tell me in 30 words, what is the news? What is their research findings? What does it mean? So what? Who cares? How does it impact on society? And if they can answer all those questions in simple language, not jargon, then we help them. So we keep asking, so what? What does it mean? So it's hard to, the media won't understand scientific jargon. So I often say to them, imagine you are meeting the vice chancellor in the, in the escalator and he asks you, what do you do? Tell him in 30 seconds, what do you do? Short and sharp. And or imagine you're speaking to a cousin who's not a scientist and you're explaining your research discovery. You're not going to use big words, big scientific words. You're going to use simple words. And, uh, you know, sometimes we have animation. You're going back to multimedia, animation. Animation helps uh, to describe uh, co complicated terms. But simple language and we get it out to the media and we come up with the angles. As former journalists and, and media relations experts, we know what makes news. So we might find the angle at the bottom of the media release. We look at the abstract and then we, we say, we take this angle. And we keep sending the media release back to the scientists to check. So we never send it out without the scientists checking. Thank you so much, Prim. I see you've got your back, Prof. Van Staden. Would you like to just um, close off on what you were sharing with us? Sorry, I don't know about that connection problem. Sorry about that. Um, what I'm saying is important that researchers also appreciate the importance of dissemination of their results beyond journal article, journal articles, you know, in the public domain and making sure that dissemination is to the public and, and that they need support for that in the same way that they need support to, to uh, you know, for their statistical analyses for some kinds of research, that they get the necessary support from people who are, you know, well uh, trained in, in um, doing the, the, the dissemination and marketing of their research findings. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Van Staden. Before we end today's session, I'd like to take another opportunity to thank Prof. Tawana Kupe, Prof. Verdi Van Staden, and Ms. Primarashni Gawa for sharing their knowledge with us today. A special thank you to UP's Faculty of Health Sciences for affording us this platform to empower each other with factual information. And finally, of course, Thank you to our viewers for watching. We trust that this was an informative session. Be sure to follow us and subscribe to all of our social media platforms such as Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube and LinkedIn to stay up to date with research findings as well as further developments in the field of health sciences. Stay safe and remember that your health is in your hands.
As Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Pretoria, I am proud to say that we are the first academic institution in South Africa to open a vaccination site for COVID-19. The vaccination program actually started the 7th of June. We set it up the week before, that is the 31st of May, for the site is inspection by the Swanet District uh, vaccination team. At this stage, our main target is the students from the Prince of Campus. And then the other group is the staff members who are above 60. The faculty itself is currently administering 96 vaccinations daily, and we will be sure to increase the capacity as soon as more vaccines are available. We are now currently helping with family medicine um, with the vaccination process both the registration as well as vaccinating. We've got some of the post-grad students, so they're doing the registration process, and then the sisters and then myself are vaccinating people. It is an outreach um, from FF Ribeiro site. They scanned my ID, scanned me in, processed me. I sat down in the chair. Um, Dr. Naidu explained everything to me, and I was vaccinated. Next was about 15 minutes of observation just to ensure that I took well to the vaccine and I was up and ready to go. I think that um, vaccination hesitancy has been an issue. Um, one of the reasons is I think the side effect profile is uh, worrisome for many people. However, they're very mild and it's very treatable. So I would encourage everyone, especially in the medical clinical setting, to get vaccinated as soon as possible. I would recommend people take it. As obviously a woman of science, a woman of medicine, I firmly believe in doctors and researchers and basically just the general health scheme. I trust them fully. At the end of the day, you want to preserve life because that is the key aim of medicine. This is a long comrade marathon. We need to vaccinate many, many people and it, the hands from the Faculty of Health Science students will be really exciting. And this is where I think the Department of Health is looking towards us as UP to show the way to the rest of the country. Mm -hmm.